Science is a way of thinking much more than it is a body of knowledge. This is a quote given by the late Carl Sagan, an astronomer and science popularizer from the late 70s to up to the late 90s. He gave this quote in his last interview in 1996. He was referring to the fact that people like to use science as this encyclopedia, you could say, that they simply pull fun facts out of and particular pieces of knowledge out of without thinking about how people came to those knowledge and fun facts at the first place critically. In order to think about these things critically, one would need to think about what makes science and what separates science from, you could say, pseudoscience. And this separation tends to be a little bit more tricky than one could imagine, hence why there are various school of thoughts about science and non-science and what makes something actually scientific, three of which I will explore in this video and the rest is up to your further investigation if you're rather curious. So one could think of various instances in which whole fields of modern science were actually derived from things which we are nowadays considered to be pseudoscience. For example, as the case with medicine. A lot of things that were used in the medical practices back in the times before Christ up to the Renaissance era were actually quite based on pseudoscience. If one was, for example, to have a psychiatric illness back in the 1100s, such as schizophrenia, it is much more probable that the diagnosis would be evil spirits or demons instead of a chemical imbalance in the brain. Thus, the cure for that is a good old-fashioned craniotomy, as that always fixes everything to let the evil spirits leave. Another modern branch in science is chemistry, and chemistry is also derived from a more pseudoscientific practice, namely in this case the practice of alchemy. Alchemy being this very occult practice in which people try to understand the meaning and nature of things through esoteric philosophies such as hermeticism, and they also conducted various experiments that are very prominent even nowadays in modern chemistry, such as distillations and such. And lastly, and more famously, the simple fact that astronomy derived from astrology. They're even a mouthful if you try to think about it. But astronomy being the science of celestial objects and just things that are beyond the terrestrial atmosphere in general, and their positions in space in contrast to astrology, which does use the observation of these celestial objects, but in order to predict these very specific individual events or these events related to things that are more terrestrial. So these are all three examples of many more that one can find about how science is derived from pseudoscience in a lot of sense. So how does one put it on this more like critical lens in order to try and separate science from non-science? Well, there are three school of thoughts that are from the 1900s all the way to the late 1900s. The philosophy of logical positivism is a very empirical school of thought that relied on a particular concept known as verificationism. A very fancy name of just saying that you need to be able to directly observe something in order to deem it to be true. The second school of thought being the school of thought of Karl Popper, a philosopher known around the 1930s, especially for his rejections of certain ideas from logical positivists. And the third school of thought being a bit different than the previous two ones, but the philosophy of Kuhn, or rather Thomas Kuhn. So the philosophy of logical positivism came from two different things that you could see, like naturally formed a synergy together, and that is the philosophy of logic and positivism. The philosophy of positivism being a philosophy that was brought upon around, I think, the 1800s, um, and that simply stated that all meaningful knowledge of something comes from things that we can directly observe. So if you cannot directly observe something, then it is not meaningful, basically. So anything that is deemed to be metaphysics, so things that are just trying to understand the nature of reality and things that you cannot directly observe, like these very abstract ideas, are not deemed to be rather meaningful knowledge. So if I were to put this into context for you is, say for example, if we were to think about electrons passing through an, a copper wire, then these electrons and these copper atoms, you could say, are all things that we cannot observe but scientists still use them as like these abstractions in order to try to explain like why something happens or why a particular thing that we can observe happens such as this current passing through a wire and kind of jolting like your voltmeter or something. 
but this view already that's something that is unobservable it can be useful in essence for actual science is a view that wasn't approached by the logical positivists they thought rather in this more like sense of this philosophy of positivism that if something isn't directly observable then it's not useful and of course the other side of this um, spectrum is already self-explanatory it's a philosophy of logic if you can logically come to a conclusion then it is also quite viable and in the case of logical positivists they rely on the logic of induction um, in order to come to conclusions for example let's say that i want to know the color of all pigeons on the earth if i were to go outside right now and count um how many pigeons there are and the color of the pigeons and if all i were to see are great pigeons then I would logically induce it because I saw about a hundred pigeons outside and because all of them were gray and if I were to go to other locations and see that there are gray pigeons as well say if I were to even travel to other countries and notice that there are just gray pigeons as well from induction so from having this small sample I would conclude that oh um, all pigeons are gray on the planet earth because i travel to these various destinations and count a bunch of pigeons and all of them were gray thus oh all pigeons on the earth are gray now is this uh, an approach of which you can always rely on now if you come up with more complex examples such as the in science you can come up with cases in which this process isn't always suffice it doesn't mean that this process isn't helpful like you can use inductions still for many different things because you don't have for example the time to go and like say make all of these observations for something so you have to use induction eventually but still induction isn't always the most reliable way to go about things and this is where another school of thought came in and that is the school of thought of the philosopher Karl Popper now Karl Popper came around in the exact same time that empiricism was hot in science and in the same time that the idea of logic positivism was very dominant in science that the way you prove things in science has to go by observing them and no other means and Karl Popper came up with a different approach to science and he thought oh instead of trying to verify things why don't we try at creating a model in which tries to falsify things so instead of having a theory and you're trying to verify it through observations why not have a theory and you test it and if you're able to falsify that theory then we we call that to be genuine because at the end of the day if you have a scientific theory it needs to be able to be put to scrutiny it needs to be able to be go to be put to rigorous testing in order to see if it's correct or not and if it's not correct you need to be able to change that theory or model because otherwise you will be stuck in a particular way of thinking about things without being able to change your view of something without being able to question or challenge the preconceived notion of things but the way Karl Popper put this in his thesis conjectures and refutations is he used different examples and back in his time Einstein was a very popular scientist already he used the theory of general relativity as a very solid example of what he wants to state with his philosophy of falsificationism. He mentions how, for example, in his framework or in his school of thought, a scientific theory should be risky. Now, what he meant by this is a scientific theory should be so daring that if you have the slightest bit of evidence against it, you're able to falsify it and that constitutes a good scientific theory. Now, of course, you can argue about that a little bit, but he, the example which he used with general relativity was a very solid example. The theory of general relativity with Einstein is a theory which aims to explain the nature of gravity without just saying if you have two massive bodies they're going to experience an invisible force between them which we will call gravity and we're only able to calculate how gravity affects the motion of these rigid bodies. General relativity rather explains why there is an attractive force between these two massive bodies. It is due to the fact that oh these massive bodies curve the nature of space-time itself. It literally curved that which we are made out of which is space and space-time itself is a metric. But technical details aside, this elegance and this explanation for what is gravity isn't what makes general relativity a good scientific theory. What makes this theory a good scientific theory is the simple fact that it makes predictions. It makes predictions of which you can test. 
And if you test this prediction and if the data from your observations or what you're testing doesn't line up with what you're supposed to get from the theory, then in essence, the theory is wrong or the theory needs tweaking. Um, and in the case of general relativity, the way in which Albert Einstein tested this theory back in the days, which kind of solidified the general relativity, he went to South Africa along with another astronomer, I think Edithun, and I think even Marie Curie was there. And um, there was basically a total eclipse at South Africa in which the moon um, came to block the sunlight. He looked at the position of the stars before the eclipse and before the sun immediately passed over them and then during the eclipse um, as, as the sun was passing um, over this um, starlight. And what was predicted from Einstein's theory was if the sun passes over these background lights then the position of these lights coming from the stars should shift ever so slightly due to the fact that as the sun passes in this region of space it curves space-time itself and it curves the trajectory of the light that is coming to reach our eyes from these distant stars. If that wasn't the case, if the sun just passed over the background stars and the apparent position of the stars remained the same then general relativity apparently was wrong in that regard and it needed tweaking but of course if they did notice a shift in the light coming from the stars then okay general relativity made it made a prediction that they were able to test and notice that oh okay this theory holds so that would make it a bit more credible which was the case with general relativity and it is why the philosopher Popper really likes using relativity as an example in his um, conjectures. Now the last school of thought which I want to tackle is slightly different from that of empiricism and that of falsificationism from Popper and that is this view of paradigms and that comes from the philosophies of Thomas Kuhn. And this philosophy dictates that in as a science is you could say this Lego tower that is constantly piling on each other and if you have a scientific theory it needs to fit within an established scientific model so it's very similar say if you're working in construction and you're building a large tower if you're trying to add more bricks on top of the um, higher portions of the tower then those bricks the material doesn't need to vary too much from the material that is already at the base as the base is already firmly established if the material that you add doesn't match up with the material that is in the foundation of this um, construction then eventually the building will just crumble in itself because either the material is too heavy or it's not able to resist wind that well etc etc so in the case of science if you have a scientific theory that makes predictions and such that isn't quite compatible with the framework that you already have then you would run into problems either your theory isn't that well or if you find enough evidence for the theory which you just established so if you put the theory to rigorous testing and you don't find any ways to falsify it if it becomes clearly abundant that this theory has something to it but it doesn't match with the previous framework then you would say that okay there needs to be a paradigm shift and what is meant by this is basically the foundation which we talked about the previous framework for a scientific say subject you have to change the entire model in order to find a new better way to tackle a particular natural phenomena a very famous example that is commonly used is the example of geocentrism and heliocentrism so geocentrism being the model of the earth at the center of the universe so the earth being in the middle and all of the planets and the sun and all of the constellations are orbiting um, the planet earth we are at the center and heliocentrism being the model which we know with the sun in the middle and the planets orbiting the sun and everything else going about their thing and you can think about geocentrism as its own paradigm as from this paradigm from this framework you can build upon all of your different um, theories about the nature of reality and interestingly you don't need a heliocentric solar system in order to be able to explain a lot of the things that we explain in the night sky it's not like geocentrism doesn't work in that regard it can most definitely work and a lot of um, astrologers literally tweaked their models and theories um, you could say about the solar system in order to explain certain observations such as the Mercury retrograde and um, the weird motion of Mars throughout the night sky and things like that so they were able to explain it with their 
geocentric you could say model of the universe but just after some time and especially with Galileo the observations of Galileo Galilei and Tycho Brahe um, by the way sorry if I butchered that name it became clearly apparent and undeniably apparent that okay heliocentrism is making all of these solid predictions and in a much more elegant and simple fashion than geocentrism ever had and eventually heliocentrism became the more accepted you could say paradigm for the way in which we view the solar system so this way of viewing things with paradigms and um, these paradigm shifts happening as you have to completely change of model these paradigm shifts are in essence what the cause of what is known as scientific revolutions for example it is a scientific revolution that we think of um, viruses being one of the main pathogens of diseases instead of attributing certain diseases for crops and such back in the early 20th century to bad soil quality or bad water quality. It is after the discovery of viruses with the use of filters and such that scientists were able to explain certain diseases much more accurately and pinpoint the exact causes of them. Besides the three frameworks that we talked about, there are even more school of thought about what we actually need to coin as science and what actually makes science um, valid or credible as it is. There are more sociological theories about science and more modern school of thoughts, but we won't go into all of those as I think these three school of thoughts are a bit more interesting in and of themselves to talk about. One last note to add onto this is that every school of thought can have their own flaws. So for example, with logical positivism and the hardcore empiric like system, you can never really observe everything and especially you can see that in the direction which modern science is going a lot of the technologies which we have right now allow us to see things that are not directly observable by any means for humans so for example we're able to use particle accelerators you can see which are basically just really glorified microscopes in order to view subatomic particles we're able to use like electron microscopes in order to view really tiny structures such as viruses we can use all of these technological advancements in order to peer through what was once deemed invisible to us humans. And it's not like logical positivists didn't work with abstract notions such as like subatomic particles and such because back in their time like way around the 1920s like the electron was already discovered the nucleus was already discovered the nucleus of an atom these discoveries were already made but they were thought to be oh necessary abstractions that we need to use in order to create more theories that we can use to predict things that we can actually observe in laboratories. But it's more so that it was thought that, oh, the electrons and the nucleus of an atom and an atom itself, there are things in which there are abstractions which we need to make in order to kind of explain our experiments, but not necessary that these things are real. In the same way, for example, that the graphical interface of a computer is in essence just a bunch of zeros and ones, it is not necessarily that the computer is built of zeros and ones, but it is electrical signals that are being sent throughout a bunch of transistors that in essence is um, afterwards created as these zeros and ones through very clever software and hard hardware developments. And nowadays, even in modern science, there are things that still rely within this very gray area of discussion on whether or not it is a more metaphysical concept or it is a more literal and physical thing. For example, the electron cloud or the orbitals of um, elements and molecules and such in chemistry and in physics, or for example, how exactly certain molecules bind to each other in biological systems, like how exactly does a particular protein bind to a particular receptor of a cell and how that interaction specifically occurs. These are all things that are not quite well understood yet. Like the philosophy of logical positivism, the philosophy of Karl Popper also has its problems and so does the one of Thomas Kuhn as well. The philosophy of Karl Popper tries to propose this idea of falsificationism, but it isn't always the case that when you falsify something from a scientific theory that you have to completely refute it either. And in the same spirit, it isn't always that you need to completely discard like a paradigm in the case of Thomas Kuhn's philosophy, as sometimes a particular building block or a foundation for a scientific branch can still hold and you're simply observing things that weren't observed before, factors that you need to include in your scientific model. So in this sense, science is more or less a way of thinking 
then it is a body of knowledge and it is the message which I wanted to bring forth with this lovely video. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. I can imagine without even editing the video already that this is going to be a long one but I hope or nevertheless it is going to be an interesting one especially for those of you who are interested in more or less like the philosophy of science as I thought this topic to be very interesting myself um, after taking a course on this subject. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope to see you guys a bit more soon. Bye!